This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tropical Horror by William Hope Hodgson We are a hundred and thirty days out of Melbourne, and for three weeks we had lain in this sweltering calm. It is midnight, and our watch on deck until four a.m. I go out and sit on the hatch. A minute later, Jokey, our youngest apprentice, joins me for a chatter. Many are the hours we have sat thus and talked in the night watches, though to be sure it is Jokey who does the talking. I am content to smoke and listen, giving the occasional grunt at seasons to show that I am attentive. Jokey has been silent for some time, his head bent in meditation. Suddenly he looks up, evidently with the intent of making some remark. As he does so, I see his face, stiffen with a nameless horror. He crouches back, his eyes staring past me at some unseen fear. Then his mouth opens. He gives forth a strangled cry and topples backwards off the hatch, striking his head against the deck. Fearing I know not what, I turn to look. Great heavens! Rising above the bulwark, seen plainly in the bright moonlight, is a vast, slobbering mouth, a fathom across. From the huge, dripping lips hang great tentacles. As I look, the thing comes further over the rail. It is rising, rising higher and higher. There are no eyes visible. Only that fearful, slobbering mouth set on the tremendous trunk-like neck, which, even as I watch, is curling inboard the stealth celery of an enormous eel. Over it comes in vast, heaving folds. Will it never end? The ship gives a slow, sullen roll to starboard as she feels the weight. Then the tail, a broad, flat-shaped mass, over the teak rail and falls with a loud slump on the deck. For a few seconds, the hideous creature lies heaped in writhing, slimy coils. Then, with quick, darting movements, the monstrous head travels along the deck. Close by the mainmast stands the harness casks, and alongside these a freshly opened cask of salt beef with the top loosely replaced. The smell of the meat seems to attract the monster, and I can hear it sniffing with a vast, indrawing breath. Then those lips open, displaying four huge fangs. There is a quick forward motion of the head, a sudden crashing, crunching sound, and beef and barrel have disappeared. The noise brings one of the ordinary seamen out of the forecastle. Coming into the night, he can see nothing for the moment. Then, as he gets further aft, he sees, and with horrified cries, rushes far. Too late! From the mouth of the thing there flashes forth a long, broad blade of glistening white, set with fierce teeth. I avert my eyes, but cannot shut out the sickening glut-glut that follows. The man on the lookout, attracted by the disturbance, has witnessed the tragedy and flies for refuge in the forecastle, flinging to the heavy iron door after him. The carpenter and the sailmaker come running out of the half-deck in their drawers. Seeing the awful thing, they rush aft to the cabin with shouts of fear. The second mate, after one glance over the break of the poop, runs down the companionway with the helmsman after him. I can hear them barring the scuttle, and abruptly I realize that I am on the main deck alone. So far I have forgotten my own danger. The past few minutes seem like a portion of an awful dream. Now, however, I comprehend my position, and, shaking off the horror that has held me, turn to seek safety. As I do so, my eyes fall upon Jokey, lying huddled and senseless with fright where he has fallen. I cannot leave him there. Close by stands the empty half-deck, a little still-built house with iron doors. The lee one is hooked open. Once inside, I am safe. Up to the present, the thing has seemed to be unconscious of my presence. Now, however, the huge barrel-like head sways in my direction. Then comes a muffled bellow, and the great tongue flickers in and out as the brute turns and swirls aft to meet me. I know there is not a moment to lose, and picking up the helpless lad, I make a run for the open door. It is only distant a few yards, but that awful shape is coming down the deck to me in great writhing coils. I reach the house and tumble in with my burden, then out on the deck again to unhook and close the door. Even as I do so, something white curls around the end of the house. With a bound, I am inside, and the door is shut and bolted. Through the thick glass of the port, I see the thing sweep around the house in a vain search for me. 
Jokey has not moved yet, so kneeling down, I loosen his shirt collar and sprinkle some water from the breaker over his face. While I am doing this, I hear Morgan shout something, then come a great shriek of terror and again that sickening glut, glut. Jokey stirs uneasily, rubs his eyes, and sits up suddenly. What was Morgan shouting? He breaks off with a cry. Where are we? I had, I have had such an awful dream. At that instant, there is a sound of running footsteps on the deck, and I hear Morgan's voice at the door. Tom, open! He stops abruptly and gives an awful cry of despair. Then I hear him rush forward. Through the porthole, I see him spring into the fore rigging and scramble madly aloft. Something steals up after him. It shows white in the moonlight. It wraps itself around his right ankle. Morgan stops dead, plucks out his sheath knife, and hacks fiercely at the fiendish thing. It lets go, and in a second, he is over the top and running for dear life up the gallant rigging. A time of quiet follows, and presently I see that the day is breaking. Not a sound can be heard save the heavy, gasping breathing of the thing. As the sun rises higher, the creature stretches itself out along the deck and seems to enjoy the warmth. Still no sound, either from the men forward or the officers aft. I can only suppose that they are afraid of attracting its attention. Yet a little later I hear the rapport of a pistol way aft, and looking out I see the servant raise its huge head as though listening. As it does so I get a huge view of the forepart, and in the daylight see what the night has hidden. There, right about the mouth, is a pair of little pig eyes that seem to twinkle with, with a diabolical intelligence. It is swaying its head slowly from side to side. Then, without warning, it turns quickly and looks right in through the port. I dodge out of sight, but not soon enough. It has seen me and brings its great mouth up against the glass. I hold my breath. My God, if it breaks the glass! I cower, horrified. From the direction of the port there comes a loud, harsh scraping. I shiver. Then I remember that there are little iron doors to shut over the port in bad weather. Without a moment's waste of time, I rise to my feet and slam to the door over the port. Then I go around the others and do the same. We are now in darkness, and I tell Jokey in a whisper to light the lamp, which, after some fumbling, he does. About an hour before midnight, I fall asleep. I'm awakened suddenly some hours later by a scream of agony and the rattle of a water dipper. There's a slight scuffling sound, then that soul-revolting glut, glut. I guess what has happened. One of the men, Thorod, has slipped out of the full castle to try and get little water. Evidently, he has trusted to the darkness to hide his movements. Poor beggar! He has paid for his attempt with his life. After this, I cannot sleep. Though the rest of the night passes quietly enough. Towards morning, I doze a bit, but wake every few minutes with a start. Jokey is sleeping peacefully. Indeed, he seems worn out with the terrible strain of the past twenty-four hours. About eight a.m. I call him, and we make a light breakfast off the dry ship's biscuits and water. Of the latter, happily, we have a good supply. Jokey seems more himself and starts to talk a little possibly somewhat louder than is safe. For as he chatters on, wondering how it will end, there comes a tremendous blow against the side of the house, making it ring again. After this, Jokey is very silent. As we sit there, I cannot but wonder what all the rest are doing and how the poor beggars, for odd, are faring, cooped up without water, as the tragedy of the night has probed. Towards noon, I hear a loud bang, followed by a terrific bellowing, then comes the great smashing of woodwork and the cries of men in pain. Vainly, I ask myself, what has happened? I begin to reason. By the sound of the report, it was evident something much heavier than a rifle or pistol, and judging from the mad roaring of the thing, the shot must have done some execution. On thinking it over further, I become convinced that, by some means, those oft have got hold of the small signal cannon we carry, and though I know that some have been hurt, perhaps killed, yet a feeling of exultation seizes me as I listen to the roars of the thing, and realize that it is badly wounded, perhaps mortally, 
After a while, however, the bellowing dies away and only an occasional roar denoting more of anger than aught else is heard. Presently I become aware, by the ship's canting over to starboard, that the creature has gone over to that side and a great hope springs up within me that possibly it has had enough of us and is going over the rail into the sea. For a time all is silent and my hopes grow stronger. I lean across and nudge Jokey who is sleeping with his head on the table. He starts up sharply with a loud cry. Hush! I whisper hoarsely. I'm not certain, but I do believe it's gone. Jokey's face brightens wonderfully, and he questions me eagerly. We wait another hour or so, with hope ever rising. Our confidence is returning fast. Not a sound can we hear, not even the breathing of the beast. I get out some biscuits, and Jokey, after rummaging in the locker, produces a small piece of pork and a bottle of ship's vinegar. We fall to with relish. After our long abstinence from food, the meal acts on us like wine, and what must Jokey do but insist on opening the door to make sure the thing has gone? This I will not allow, telling him that at least it would be safe to open the iron port covers first and have a look out. Jokey argues, but I am immovable. He becomes excited. I believe the youngster is light-headed. Then, as I turn to unscrew one of the after covers, Jokey makes a dash for the door. Before he can undo the bolts, I have him, and after a short struggle, lead him back to the table. Even as I endeavor to quiet him, there comes at the starboard door, the door that Jokey has tried to open, a sharp, loud sniff, sniff, followed immediately by a thunderous grunting howl and a foul stench of putrid breath sweeps in under the door. A great trembling takes me, and were it not for the carpenter's tool chest, I should fall. Jokey turns very white and is violently sick, after which he is seized by a hopeless fit of sobbing. Hour after hour passes, and, weary to death, I lie down on the chest upon which I have been sitting and try to rest. It must be about half past two in the morning, after a somewhat longer doze, that I am suddenly awakened by a most tremendous uproar away forward. Men's voices shrieking, cursing, praying, but in spite of the terror expressed, so weak and feeble, while in the mist, and at times broken off short with that hellishly suggestive glut, glut, is the unearthly bellowing of the thing. Fear incarnate seizes me, and I can only fall to my knees and pray. Too well I know what is happening. Jokey has slept through it all, and I am thankful. Presently, under the door, there stills a narrow ribbon of light, and I know that the day has broken on the second morning of our imprisonment. I let Jokey sleep on. I will let him have peace while he may. Time passes, but I take little notice. The thing is quiet, possibly sleeping. About midday, I eat a little biscuit and drink some water. Jokey still sleeps. It is best so. A sound breaks the stillness. The ship gives a slight heap, and I know that once more the thing is awake. Round the deck it moves, causing the ship to roll perceptibly. Once it goes far, I fancy it again to explore the full castle. Evidently it finds nothing, for it returns almost immediately. It pauses a moment at the house, and then goes on further aft. Up aloft, somewhere in the fore rigging, there rings out a peal of wild laughter, though sounding very faint and far away. The horror stops suddenly. I listen intently, but hear nothing, save a sharp creaking beyond the after end of the house, as though a strain had come upon the rigging. A minute later I hear a cry aloft, followed almost immediately by a loud crash on the deck that seems to shake the ship. I wait in anxious fear. What is happening? The minutes pass slowly. Then comes another frightened shout. It ceases suddenly. The suspense has become terrible and I am no longer able to bear it. Very cautiously I open one of the after port covers and peep out to see a fearful sight. There, with its tail upon the deck and its vast body curled around the mainmast, is a monster, its head above the topsail yard and its great claw-armed tentacles weaving in the air. The first proper sight that I have had of the thing. Good heavens! It must weigh a hundred tons! Knowing that I shall have time, I open the port itself and then crane my head out and look up. There, on the extreme end of the lower topsail yard, I see one of the able seamen. Even down here, I note the staring horror of his face. At this moment, he sees me and gives a weak, hoarse cry for help. I can do nothing for him. 
As I look, the great tongue shoots out and licks him off the yard, much as might a dog a fly off the window pane. Higher still, but happily out of reach, are two more of the men. As far as I can judge, they are lashed to the mast above the royal yard. The thing attempts to reach them, but after a futile effort it ceases, and starts to slide down, coil by coil, to the deck. While doing this, I notice a great gaping wound on its body some twenty feet above the tail. I drop my gaze from aloft and look aft. The cabin door is torn from its hinges, and the bulkhead, which, unlike the half-deck, is of tweak wood, is partly broken down. With a shudder, I realize the cause of those cries after the cannon shot. Turning, I screw my head round and try to see the foremast, but cannot. The sun, I notice, is low, and night is near. Then I draw in my head and fasten up both port and cover. How will it end? Oh, how will it end? After a while, Doki wakes up. He is very restless, yet, though he has eaten nothing during the day, I cannot get him to touch anything. Night draws on. We are too weary, too dispirited to talk. I lie down, but not to sleep. Time passes. A ventilator rattles violently somewhere on the main deck, and there sounds constantly that slurring, gritting noise. Later, I hear a cat's agonized howl, and then again all is quiet. Some time after comes a great splash alongside. Then, for some hours, all is silent as the grave. Occasionally I sit up on the chest and listen, yet never a whisper of noise comes to me. There is an absolute silence. Even the monotonous creak of the gear has died away entirely, and at last a real hope is springing up within me. That splash, the silence, Surely I am justified in hoping. I do not wake Jokey this time. I will prove first for myself that all is safe. Still, I wait. I will run no unnecessary risks. After a time, I creep up to the altar port and will listen. But there is no sound. I put up my hand and feel at the screw. Then again I hesitated, yet not for long. Noiselessly, I begin to unscrew the fastening of the heavy shield. It swings loose on its hinge, and I pull it back and peer out. My heart is beating madly. Everything seems strangely dark outside. Perhaps the moon has gone behind a cloud. Suddenly, a beam of moonlight enters through the port, and it goes as quickly. I stare out. Something moves. Again, the light streams in, and now I seem to be looking into a great cavern at the bottom of which quivers and curls something palely white. My heart seems to stand still. It is a horror. I start back and seize the iron port flap to slam. As I do so, something strikes the glass like a steam ram, shatters it to atoms, and flicks past me into the berth. I scream and spring away. The port is quite filled with it. The lamp shows it dimly. It is curling and twisting here and there. It is as thick as a tree and covered with a smooth, slimy skin. At the end of it is a great claw like a lobster's, only a thousand times larger. I cower down in the farthest corner. It has broken the tool chest to pieces, and with one click of those frightful mandibles, Jokey has crawled under a bunk. The thing sweeps round in my direction. I feel a drop of sweat trickle slowly down my face. It tastes salty. Nearer comes that awful death. Crash! I roll over backwards. It has crushed the water breaker against which I faint and am rolling in the water across the floor. The claw drives up, then down with a quick, uncertain movement, striking the deck a dull, hollow blow a foot from my head. Jokey gives a little gasp of horror. Slowly the thing rises and starts feeling its way around the berth. It plunges into a bunk and pulls out a bolster, nips it in half and drops it, then moves on. It is feeling along the deck. As it does so, it comes across a half of the bolster. It seems to toy with it, then pick it up. It takes it out through the port. A wave of putrid air fills the berth. There is a grating sound, and something enters the port again. Something white and tapering and set with teeth. Hither and thither it crawls, rasping over the bunks, ceiling, and deck, with a noise like that of a great saw at work. Twice it flickers above my head, and I close my eyes. Then off it goes again. It sounds now on the opposite side of the berth and nearer to Jokey. 
Suddenly the harsh, rasping noise becomes muffled as though the teeth were passing across some soft substance. Jokey gives a horrid little scream, then breaks off in a bubbling, whistling sound. I open my eyes. The tip of the vast tongue is curled tightly around something that drips, then is quickly withdrawn. Allowing the moonbeams to steal again into the berth, I rise to my feet. Looking around, I note in a mechanical sort of way the wrecked state of the berth, the shattered chests, the dismantled bunks, and something else. Jokey! I cry and tingle all over. There is that awful thing again at the port. I glance around for a weapon. I will revenge, Jokey. Ah, they are right under the lamp, where the wreck of the carpenter's chest screws the floor lies a small hatchet. I spring forward and seize it. It is small, but so keen, so keen. I feel its razor's edge lovingly. Then I am back at the port. I stand to one side and raise my weapon. The great tongue is feeling its to those fearsome remains. It reaches them, and as it does so, with a scream of, Jokey! Jokey! I strike savagely again, and again, and again, gasping as I strike. Once more, and the monstrous mass falls to the deck, writhing like a hideous eel. A vast warm flood rushes in through the porthole. There is a sound of breaking steel and an enormous bellowing. A singing comes in my ears and grows louder, louder. Then the birth grows indistinct and suddenly dark. Extract from the log of the steamship Hispionida. June 24th, latitude north, longitude west, 11 a.m. Sighted four-masted barge about four points on the port bow, flying signal of distress. Ran down to her and sent a boat aboard. She proved to be the Glen Doon, homeward bound from Melbourne to London. Found things in a terrible state. Decks covered with blood and slime. Steel deckhouse stove in. Broke open door and discovered youth of about nineteen in the last stages of a nation. Also, part remains of boy about fourteen years of age. There was a great quantity of blood in the place, and a huge curled up mass of whitish flesh weighing about half a ton, one end of which appeared to have been hacked through with a sharp instrument. Found forecastle door open and hanging from one hinge. Doorway bulged. I saw something had been forced through. Went inside. Terrible state of affairs. Blood everywhere. Broken chests. Smashed bunk, but no men nor remains. Went aft again and found youth showing signs of recovery. When he came around, gave the name of Thompson. Said that they had been attacked by a huge serpent, though it must have been sea serpent. He was too weak to say much, but told us there were some men up in the mainmast. Sent a hand aloft, who reported them lashed to the royal masts and quite dead. Went aft to the cabin. Here found the bulkhead smashed to pieces and the cabin door lying on the deck near the after hatch. Found body of captain down Lazaret, but no officers. Noticed among the wreckage part of the carriage of a small cannon. Came aboard again. Have sent second mate with six men to work her into port. Thompson is with us. He has written out his version of the affair. We certainly consider that the state of the ship as we found her bears out in every respect his story. Signed, William Norton, Master. Tom Briggs, First Mate. The end of a tropical horror.